um, tell you that today's topic, we have a few things that I'm going to go over here today on forecasting with friends. One, uh, and the primary thing that we're going to focus on is earthquakes, believe it or not. And not talking about earthquakes in California or earthquakes in Japan or some far off place. We're talking about right here in the Lone Star State, a rash of earthquakes that have been taking place here over the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, so we're going to talk about that. The other thing is uh, we have some Saharan dust that's moving into our area that I think you'll start to notice this afternoon, and it may potentially start to affect our air quality a little bit today, maybe a little more tomorrow, leading to uh, increased levels of what we call particulate matter, which is basically dust or aerosols in the air. So that may affect us tomorrow and heading into Thursday as well. We have a potential development in the tropics. Not too worried about it at this point, but it's going to be something we'll watch really closely late this week and heading into the weekend. And uh, then, of course, we also have our very hot, humid conditions here. Not quite under a heat advisory yet, but much of Texas is. And we might be placed under a heat advisory, or at least we'll get really close to it coming up here over the next uh, few days. So I have queued up here on the weather graphics uh, a look at um, these earthquakes that have been occurring. And uh, we are waiting on an expert who's going to be joining us here in just a moment. And I'll introduce you to him whenever we get him online. Hopefully it will be momentarily. But what I have plotted here are all of the earthquakes that have been observed by the U.S. Geological Survey over the last 10 days. Now look where those earthquakes have been. California, you'd expect to see a lot of them. Now keep in mind, this goes all the way down to magnitude 1. So a lot of these are very, you know, basically imperceptible earthquakes, um, but they are measured on, on seismographs. So California had the majority of them. There were a few there along the California and Nevada state line. There were a couple of them in southern Utah. But notice now in Texas, yeah, uh, out in West Texas, there has been a bit of a rash of earthquakes taking place. I made them bigger here so we can see them. I noticed there were a few small ones there to the south of San Antonio as well. Um, probably too small to really even be felt, but it's this area of West Texas that has had somewhere around 80 or so earthquakes happen here over the last week and a half. And that's not super common, although we have seen earthquakes happening out there more and more. There have been some out there on your way out to El Paso, and then a flurry of them have been taking place in this area, which is uh, near um, Abilene. This is just off to the west of Abilene, Texas. And uh, this is a, an area that's very heavily used for oil and gas exploration. And so we're going to talk with uh, Dr. Brian Stump here coming up in just a few moments um, about that. Now, um, I think we do have another map queued up here, which will show you exactly uh, where all of this happened. Uh, the earthquake that rattled West Texas on this past Saturday afternoon, um, like one that happened the previous Friday the day before, it was centered around Hermley, Texas, which is right where you see those kind of bright yellow on the top hand uh, side of your screen. Uh, the one on Saturday was a magnitude 4.3. The one on Friday was a magnitude 5.1. There have been more than 80 earthquakes occurring there over the last week, incredible. All right, well, let's turn our attention here briefly to uh, what's happening weather-wise across the area. Hold on, I'm hit, trying to hit the right button here to get my thing queued up. Um, Bear with me here. Look, this is live. This is live TV here, folks. Um, well, I'll get that. Can you guys take Max 3 for me? You think you could do that? That would be awesome if you could. Yeah, Juan is going to hook me up. My one friend that I have today, Juan, is going to take Max 3 for me. All right, well, here's what's going on in the tropics, and not much. The answer is not much. We have a lot of dusty, dry air over most of the Atlantic Ocean, but there is a very broad circulation here, and I mean by broad, I mean like this is covering hundreds of miles of the Atlantic Ocean, this tropical wave, and so it's not, you know, coalescing into a strong area of low pressure at this point. Uh, the area that's highlighted in orange here is highlighted by the National Hurricane Center as being an area for possible development. When they update this later on today, I wouldn't be shocked if they moved this orange area a little farther to the south, maybe even to the south of Cuba, because the latest model runs, uh, the GFS and Euro, were actually showing you know, some potential, you know, very um, 
not very robust circulation. But so let me show you what I'm talking about here. So this is the Euro or European computer model, and I have this set to take us through Saturday. So right now I'm trying to keep the tropical wave sort of in the middle portion of your screen here, and you'll see that showing up in the form of some rain stretching from San Juan, Puerto Rico, all the way through the Turks and Caicos Islands, and then over to the Bahamas. Now at the very end of this um, projection is Saturday, and that's when you may be able to notice that there's a little circulation occurring there just to the south of Cuba, and just a pretty broad general area of rain from the Florida Keys all the way back over to the Bahamas and points eastward. All right, and now let me just uh, end with this uh, really quick, which is that we're, uh, you know, going to be watching that tropical wave closely. All right, I'm very happy to say that we have joining us from Southern Methodist University, Dr. Brian Stump, who is, uh, I would say, the foremost authority here in Texas for exactly what we are going to be talking about today. I want to make sure that we have him set up here. We're still clicking a few things there on the Zoom meeting. Um, in the, uh, can you hear me, sir? Um, I can hear you, but there are a lot of other voices on this panel. Okay, we don't want that, so I don't know. We need to work on that. Uh, I think they call that in the biz mix minus, so we're going to try to get that out. Uh, I apologize, but there may be like four or five different people talking. Oh, okay. Well, um, we'll give them a moment to sort of maybe shake that out. Hopefully, it's uh, not too hard to work the kinks out on that one. Um, so as we prepare to talk to, uh, to Dr. Stump, just to... Um, Reiterate, this happened near Hermley, Texas, 928 a.m. this past Friday, magnitude 5.1. That's a sizable earthquake by Texas standards. Are we good to go? Yes, absolutely. Okay, good, good. Uh, all right, so Doctor, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. I want to let everybody know that uh, Dr. Stump is a professor um, at uh, Southern Methodist University, a great institution. You have your uh, PhD in uh, geosciences from Cal Berkeley. Not an easy thing to do. So I want to just set the stage for who you are and the fact that you've done significant research in what we're going to talk about because, well, I'll explain in a moment why I want to make sure folks know you're we're, you're an expert. Let's talk yeah. about uh, Texas earthquakes. First of all, let's set the stage. Does okay. Texas have earthquakes? Because people don't know that, that Texas does have earthquakes. Uh, yes, they do. And um, they, they go back to um, an earthquake near Valentine, Texas in 1931, which was a magnitude 6.5. Um, more recently, though, starting in about 2008, um, we began to see earthquakes that uh, turn out to be related to oil and gas operations. All right, now let me tell you, I have mentioned this on the air scant few times in my career <laughs> since 2008, mm -hmm. since the, the birth of the uh, hydraulic fracturing revolution, really, which has been very important to the U.S. economy. But, Doctor, when Absolutely. I bring it up, people get mad at me. Have you experienced that as well? Well, I, I think that um, it, it turns out Texas has faults, and those faults have stresses that are on them, but many of them haven't moved for a long, long time. And um, when we found over, um, actually starting back in the 1960s, that when we inject fluids underground, those fluids can change the stresses and trigger some of those faults that haven't moved for a very long time. In this case, um, the location of this magnitude 5.1, is this an area that's very active as far as oil and gas exploration, drilling, things like that? So um, I, I don't know the um, current operations in the region, but it is an area near Snyder, Texas. And um, in the 70s and um, in the early 2000s, there were earthquake sequences just a little bit north of Snyder that had magnitude 4.6 and a magnitude 4.4. These events now are a little bit east of Snyder, um, maybe 10 kilometers or so. And uh, the biggest event is of comparable size to what was seen in 74 to 82 and 2006 to 2012. Uh, when we talk about earthquake magnitude, um, Professor, mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a big difference between a four and a five. Um, yes. Could you explain to, to folks? Yeah. I mean, so what it, that it's is? it's yeah. It, it's confusing to people, but one order of magnitude, the difference between a four and a five, is ten times the ground motion. Mm -hmm. So a five has ten times more shaking of the ground than a magnitude four. 
magnitude three would have 10 less as well. So the difference between a magnitude three and a magnitude five would be 100 times. Uh, that is uh, important to remember because, you know, sometimes you say, well, we've had a bunch of fours and now we had a five. So what's the difference, right? Well, it's 10 mm -hmm. times, 10 times the difference. It's 10 times. Yeah. And, and actually that 5.1 was felt here in the DFW area by people. So it, it was big enough to generate seismic waves that traveled a long distance. That is pretty incredible to, to hear that people, because I did hear that, that uh, folks in downtown Dallas actually felt it. Mm -hmm. Recently, so aside from this big one that occurred uh, out there close to Snyder, Texas, mm -hmm. in recent years, there have been more frequent earthquakes, like threes and fours, happening up there in North Texas in your area. Uh, y yes, um, from about 2008 to about 2016 in the Fort Worth Basin, we experienced earthquakes, none of them as large as this one. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, it's my opinion that they were related to oil and gas operations. Now, as those oil and gas operations have wound down, the earthquakes themselves have wound down. So there have been few earthquakes in recent years. Now, just to be clear to people, the, these haven't really been a, a hazard, right? I mean, it's, it's more of a, a curiosity or are they a hazard? Well, um, certainly a magnitude five, close to the event, um, you could have damage, minor damage to, to, uh, to buildings, to infrastructure. Um, probably even a magnitude four, if you're really close, um, you know, there might be a crack in the wall or something like that. And to somebody who's, that's their wall, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is some, some hazard and some risk and uh, it behooves us in Texas to understand and estimate those hazards and try to mitigate or minimize them. It looked like it was pretty close to Interstate 20 out there. I wonder if engineers, when they are even designing the um, the interstate out there, if well, I mean, I'm sure they have to take seismic activity into yeah, consideration. Yeah, I think that they're, they're yeah, they, they do have a criteria, particularly for infrastructure like that. Mm -hmm. But after an earthquake, um, a big earthquake, you always want to, you know, inspect things and make sure that they perform to the way in which uh, they were designed. Now down here yeah, in the not Houston an engineer, area, so <laughs> right uh, down here in the Houston area, I know our geology is is different. Um, I know that we have things like uh, you know we have a lot of sinkholes around here that mm -hmm. happen from time to time, and there's uh, salt under the surface, like these salt yes. domes and things. So w we can get small ones here, can't we? I mean, I've never felt one. I've never heard of anybody feeling one. Yeah, there there could be, um, and historically, um, I think if we go back over a hundred years, there've been some small events, but uh, not as uh, much activity as we as we see right now out in West Texas. Well, it's amazing. Before I want to ask you one outside the box question, <laughs> and I'm asking you this because people on social media ask this question, okay, and have asked me this question, believe it or not, and mm -hmm. they're. You know how social media is, uh, Professor. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff on there all the time. And it just happened to coincide that the the two recent f um, total solar eclipses um, made an X over the New Madrid uh, fault line up there in Missouri. And although mm -hmm. obviously there's no reason that that would have any physical effect whatsoever, that is the site of the largest um, earthquake in continental U.S. history, I think. So yes, w um, what are your thoughts about the, the seismic activity on that fault line? Because it seems to have the Internet a buzz. Yes, um, th that that fault line probably has the greatest risk for the uh, eastern U.S. Um, because it's had magnitude 7.5 events and uh, it's an area where there is seismicity. Um, and so it, there's a place where it's super important to understand the hazard, Think about the risk and make sure that building codes are up to date. Um, whether or not the uh, interactions of an eclipse, uh, those the, 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 in those kinds of instances, there's probably not going to be a triggering mechanism, um, a stress change. But um, that doesn't mean there won't be earthquakes in that region, and it's one to pay a careful attention because there's so much population in those areas today. Definitely. Okay, I want to, I don't know if you saw this, as I was doing a little bit of research for this, I came across an article that was released yesterday. It was on Seeking Alpha. That's like a stock uh, website, you know, a mm -hmm. company stock. And so what they said is that the Railroad Commission of Texas uh, said mm -hmm. uh, on Monday that it has opened an investigation 
um, after a series of earthquakes in the Permian Basin. The regulator said it's inspecting disposal wells within a two and a half mile radius of the cluster of temblers that happened in the Camp Springs area. Do you think that's appropriate to do? And, and if they do find that there's a link between um, wastewater injection wells, uh, frac uh, uh, fracking and that kind of thing, is there any liability, you know, on, on a part of the oil companies? But what do you, can anything be done about yeah. it? Yeah, I, I don't know about liability, but in terms of best practices and uh, mitigating um, future events, I think it's wise to uh, see what kind of activities is there because we do know that disposal of fluids can trigger earthquakes. And so if there's an ongoing earthquake sequence, one way of mitigating it is to change some of those practices. Wow, it's amazing. Real quick, I have one last question, Professor. Sure. It's not often that I get to pick somebody's brain who, you know, it's, it's so knowledgeable. Um, the magnitude 6.5 that you mentioned in mm -hmm. Valentine, Texas, what what caused that one? Was it just an old fashioned, uh, old fault uh, it in was, West Texas? Uh, what, what I would say, even this, these earthquakes that have happened um, over the last couple of weeks, they're all on faults and they're all tectonic stress on the faults. Um, in the case of the Valentines, it was a tectonic fault that moved um, and, uh, it, you know, it was about 10 times bigger than this one um, um, near Snyder. So uh, and uh, and even the ones that we've had are our, our old faults. Um, you know, they still have stress on them. The old faults don't die. As I get older, I kind of like that. Um, and uh, um, but they can be reactivated. All right, so I've definitely learned something. So it's not that the fracking causes the earthquake per se, it's that it may upset the faults that are already- It changes the stresses so that they can trigger the, uh, the events. Okay, very good. Well, uh, doctor, thank you so much for joining us from Southern Methodist University. Dr. Brian Stump, if you'd like to look him up and read his paper, which I did, uh, the one that you came out with um, studying this uh, activity between you know the, the potential link between fracking and, mm -hmm. and earthquakes. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you have a very busy schedule and uh, have a good fall semester. Okay, well, we'll look forward to it and thank you for reaching out. All right, thank you very much, sir. All right, well, Bye -bye. that'll do it for this first uh, long block of Forecasting with Friends. Back in a few with more. All right, well, fingers crossed we don't get any earthquakes around here anytime soon, although I think that was a really, really interesting uh, bunch of information from the professor. Moving on now to weather. Severe weather moved through the state of Tennessee yesterday. Check this out. You got to come to your screen and take a look at this. Look at right there at the middle of your screen what happens to that trailer. Bam! Um, an apparent tornado hit Middle Tennessee State University. This is surveillance camera footage uh, that shows this you know, small, certainly what appears to be a twister rolling through that campus. Campus is located in Murfreesboro, which is southeast of Nashville. By the way, the Nashville area, no stranger to tornadoes. It's actually pretty frequent uh, that it happens around here. The tornado tossed around an equipment trailer. This was located outside the football stadium. Luckily, no one was inside the equipment trailer and there were no reports of any injuries from Middle Tennessee State University. By the way, there's been a lot of active weather there in Tennessee, including some serious flooding that happened at Dollywood. It was not, not good to see either. So luckily, nobody was injured in that tornado. Now we want to talk about the ongoing tremendous wildfire that has been impacting California. Yeah, this is the park fire that now has burned 585 square miles. That is approximately the size of the entire city of Houston. That's how much has been burned. Uh, they've been working very, very hard to get this thing under control. As of yesterday, it was only 12% contained. Um, and this continues to not just burn, you know, valuable uh, forest land out there in California, but it also is spreading smoke across much of North America. And in fact, I have a map to show you that. So on the left hand side of your screen is obviously California, and we have a lot of fires burning in Oregon as well. So California and Oregon both spreading fire into the atmosphere. The gray that you see there crosses northern Nevada. It crosses over to Idaho and then makes its way over to the northern plains of the US. And you know, eventually this could 
get a little closer to our area. Typically it takes several weeks, but the smoke will eventually spread at some point or another across much of the country. This is a look at our future cast projection of where the smoke is going to be, and you'll see that smoke may actually make its way all the way across cities like Minneapolis and Chicago and over to the Carolinas, maybe even as far south as southern Georgia. Some of this smoke is coming from California. Some of the smoke is also left over from large wildfires that hit uh, northern Canada over the last couple of weeks. Right now it's not headed toward the Houston area, but don't be surprised if maybe in a week or two, you know, we're talking about maybe some smoke hanging around um, as a you know, sort of diffuse smoke coming from those fires out in California. Wow. All right, well, up ahead in your forecast, we have a lot to talk about, including local air quality due to Saharan dust, some possible tropical development, and our continued swampy heat around here in the Houston area. Back in a couple of minutes. All right, well, let's talk about weather here. Starting to look a bit hazy out there. I think it'll look a lot hazier tomorrow. For right now, the main concern is the heat and the humidity. So current temperature is 90 here at 1126 in the morning with a dew point very high of 77. That's typically something we would see maybe in the morning near the coastline, but midday dew point of 77 is extremely muggy. That gives us a heat index value right now of 102. Want to show you a little bit about some flooding that's been taking place. Nothing major near Houston, but we do have a couple of spots that are experiencing flooding, including minor flooding that's taking place here near New Caney. This is the east fork of the San Jacinto River as it runs down toward Lake, uh, Lake Houston. It was blocking an FM road there um, at least yesterday and over the weekend. I do think that that has fallen. It's gone from moderate flood category to uh, minor flood status. And then down here, the San Bernard River as it runs by Sweeney uh, right now is at a current stage of just over 10 feet. Uh, the forecast crest looks like has already happened or is, you know, it's sort of wavering here. Uh, in between minor and moderate flood stage. So, you know, residents there urge to stay away from the banks of the river while it's running high like this. Heat index value is the big story across the area today. Currently, Galveston Island experiencing a heat index of 108. Yeah, 109 for Sugarland and about 102 in Houston right now. We're in the midst of a um, bit of a pattern change, well, a major pattern change uh, compared to what we had over the last seven days or so, which was low pressure hanging over us. Now we have high pressure that's in place, which is going to sort of uh, keep the rain at a minimum, not necessarily at zero, but at a minimum. Now here comes a plume of that Saharan dust here. It shows up obviously as the dark brown here on our forecast map. That Saharan dust is going to be dominating the day for tomorrow and Thursday, leading to potentially some uh, problem air quality. We'll tell you about that that should it happen. Our next best chance for rain comes up Sunday and Monday. I'll see you in a few coming up on Fox 26 News at noon.